Hey everybody, how's it going? I'm Paul, I'm with TheDiceyReview.com, and tonight we're going to be looking at the 1-4 player game Baseball Highlights 2045, designed by Mike Fitzgerald and released by Eagle Griffin Games. Baseball Highlights comes with all of the components that you see here, including four stadium mats, four 15-card starting decks, one 60-card free agent deck, 60 wooden pawns in white, blue, and red that represent batters and base runners, four player aids, four run scored markers, four games won markers, and four double-sided home and visitor pennant markers. Before setting up, decide which version of the game you want to play. In our example, we're going to be playing a standard two-player game. To set up for a standard two-player game, each player will take a player mat and place it on their preferred side. The player mats are double-sided and are left and right-handed. Next, each player will select their starting team, shuffle the deck, and place it in their lineup spot. Next, each player will take a games won and a run scored marker and place them on the appropriate spaces of the track. Randomly determine who will be the home and the visitor team and then each player will take their pennant marker and place it on the appropriate side in the space provided. Next, shuffle the 60 card free agent deck and then deal out six players from the top of the deck into what the game refers to as a buy row. We'll discuss in more detail later what a buy row is and how players can interact with it. Make sure that there's an adequate supply of the white, blue, and red base runner and batter tokens. And finally, make sure that each player has a player aid if they need it. Baseball Highlights 2045 pits players head-to-head -head in a mock World Series competition. Players will compete in what the game refers to as a sequence of mini-games to see who can be the first to win four games and be crowned the champion in a best-of-seven series. A mini-game consists of players placing cards into their in-play area, beginning with the visitor player. When a player plays a card into the in-play area, some immediate actions may take effect, they'll threaten some hits, and then their opponent will have a chance to play a card in response to either cancel out the threatened hits or perform some other type of action and threaten hits of their own. Players will continue to do this until each player has played six cards. After each player has played all six cards, whoever has the most runs is declared the winner and gets to mark one game one on their games one track. Each player will draw six cards from the top of their deck. If they want to, a player can place one card in the on-deck space of their player board. If they choose to do this, they will immediately draw one card to replace the card that they've placed on deck. There are many reasons that a player will want to place one of their cards on deck, and the strategy for this will become more apparent as you play the game more often. Before we go into the step-by-step -step process of what will happen in a mini-game, it might be helpful to look at a card from both a starting team and a free agent and break down the card in more detail so that you understand what you're looking at. Free agent cards will have a number in the red diamond in the top right as you can see here. This is the cost to purchase these cards during what the game calls buy rounds. There will be multiple buy rounds during a World Series where players have a chance to spend income to make their deck better. The green number of each card is the income that is produced by this card. The income produced by these cards will allow a player to buy the free agents based on the price that we just looked at. Each player card will also have a player type. As you can see, this free agent, Hideo Tanaka, is a cyborg, and the standard rookie is a natural. Players can either be naturals, cyborgs, or robots. Below the player type, you will see a player's immediate action box. The immediate action box displays a special action that this player will perform when they are played. Below the immediate action is the space for hit boxes. These spaces will detail the hits that each card will threaten to resolve if left unchecked. Some cards may also have a pinch hit symbol. This symbol allows this card to be used for a specific action that we'll look in more detail later. Finally, the symbol in the bottom left represents the speed of the threatened runners. 
Players will see cards that either have slow runners, average runners, or fast runners. Slow runners are represented by white pawns, average runners are represented by blue pawns, and fast runners are represented by red pawns. When playing a card into your in-play area, you resolve the card in a specific order. First, the immediate action would be resolved. This card would allow a player to cancel one threatened hit of their opponent. Then, this card would threaten a hit of its own. Cards can either threaten singles, doubles, triples, or home runs. Once again, the speed of the threatened hit is determined by the symbol in the bottom left. In this instance, this card would threaten an average single. An average running pawn would be placed in the space illustrated to represent this threatened hit. It would now be the opponent's turn to play their own card to try and deal with this threat. If the opponent was unable to deal with this hit, you would resolve your hit. In this case, this runner would get a single. Singles move a runner to first base. A double would move a runner to second base. And a triple would move a runner to third base. A home run would allow a player to score with that runner. When resolving a hit when you have a base runner, it's important to note that the speed of your base runner is determined by the hit being resolved. For instance, if you're resolving a single, your base runner will move one base. There are a few exceptions to this rule. An average runner will be able to score on a single if they're at second. A fast runner will always move one base more than the hit, no matter where they are. So in this instance, even if a fast runner were on first, they would move two bases on a single, and they would move three bases on a double. It's important to note that a slow runner will always move the speed of the hit, no matter what base they're on. On a player's turn, they have one of two options. They can either play a card into their in-play area and then resolve the card as we looked at earlier, or they can discard a card showing the pinch hit symbol to their dugout. This will allow them to do one of two things. They can either play the card that's in their on-deck space, or they can play the top card from their deck. This can be especially helpful to surprise your opponent with a very powerful defensive action. Now that we've looked at how to resolve cards and how to run bases in more detail, let's go ahead and walk through an example of one quick minigame. The visiting team starts off by playing the first card. They will play this rookie robot into their in-play area. There's no immediate action to resolve with this card, but this card will threaten an average double. The average base runner pawn will be placed on the home plate to represent this. It's now the opponent's turn. The home player decides to play this rookie robot. This card has no immediate action to be resolved, but it threatens a double of its own. The speed of the double is average. Since there was no immediate action canceling the threatened double of the visiting team, the visitor's hit would now be immediately resolved. This average double will move this runner to second base. It's now the visiting team's turn to play a card in response to the threatened hit of the home team. The visiting team decides to play this natural rookie. There's an immediate action to be resolved on this card. Glove cancel one hit. This threatened double would be removed because of the glove's immediate ability. It's important to note that if there are multiple hits being threatened, the player resolving the immediate action gets to choose which runner is removed. Now that this card's immediate ability has been resolved, the card would threaten an average single. It's now the home team's turn to respond to this threatened hit. The home team decides to play this natural rookie that has the glove immediate ability. This will cancel the threatened hit of the visiting team. It's important to note, however, that there are no hits in the hitbox of this card, so no hits will be threatened by this card. Since the visiting team has no hit to worry about, they play a card that simply threatens an average home run. If left unchecked, this card will score two runs for the visiting team and give them a big advantage. Play will continue back and forth in this fashion until each player has played six cards. It's important to note that the home team always gets to play the last card. After the home team has played the last card, the visiting team will have one last chance 
to do what the game refers to as a visiting save action. This action doesn't always take place, but from time to time, the home player's card, if resolved, will allow the player to either tie the game or win. As we can see in this example, the home team has played a card that threatens an average single. If left unchecked, this average single would score the runner on second, tying the game and sending it into extra innings. The visiting player has a chance to stop this if they wish. They can either turn over a card that they have on deck if they still have a card on deck, or they can turn over the top card from their lineup. When using a card for a visitor save action, everything but the immediate action is ignored. In this instance, this card would cancel all of the hits versus a natural. Since the card that the home team was threatening was a natural, this card would take effect and the hits would not be resolved. If both teams are tied at the end of a mini game, players will go into what the game refers to as extra innings. Extra innings is essentially a very condensed mini game that is played in sudden death, meaning that if one player is allowed to score more runs than the other, they immediately win. In extra innings, each player will draw the top three cards from the top of their deck. Each player would select one of the three cards and place it face down on their in-play area. Then each player would reveal their played card simultaneously. The players would first place the pawns for any threatened hits, and then beginning with the home team, each card's immediate action would be resolved. In the case of the home team, this immediate action allows them to change all threatened hits to walks. It would then be the visiting team's turn to resolve their immediate action. In this case, this card doesn't have an immediate action, and after that, any hits that weren't canceled are then resolved. Anytime a player is resolving a walk, the batter simply moves one base. If there are runners in front of the batter, they are pushed forward. So in this instance, this runner would move to third, this runner would move to second, and this player would go to first on a walk. The second walk would then be resolved, pushing this runner home and winning the game for the visitor team. Any cards that weren't played in extra innings are discarded to the dugout. At the end of each minigame, there are a few cleanup steps that take place. If a player has a card in their on-deck space, they can choose to either discard the card or place it back on the top of their deck. Then, any batter pawns that are still on the bases would be removed. The run markers would be placed back at zero, and then players would use the cards in their in-play section to generate revenue for a buy round. When looking at revenue generated for the buy round, each player will look at the numbers in the green circles on all of their in-play cards. The player that's generated less revenue gets to choose who buys first from the buy row. If there's a tie, the player who lost the previous minigame gets to choose who buys first. In this case, the home team has generated 7 revenue and the visiting team has generated 8. So the home team decides to buy first. When purchasing free agents from the buy row, players have to pay attention to the cost in the top right. The home team decides to buy this free agent that costs exactly 7. The purchased free agent will immediately be replaced in the buy row from the top of the free agent deck. The purchased free agent will be placed on the top of the player's lineup. This card will be used in the next round. It's very important to note that each team must maintain a 15 player roster. To represent this, one of the cards that's in play will have to be sent to the minors. The home team decides to send this card to the minor leagues, placing it up here to represent that. This card is now out of the game for that player and won't be used in future rounds. After making all of the purchases that they want to, the players then discard any of the cards still in their in-play area to the dugout. It's now the other player's turn to buy. After a buy round has been completed at the end of each minigame, each player will perform the standard minigame setup of drawing six cards and then choosing if they want to place a card in their on-deck space. The first player to win four games is the winner. There are variants for both three and four player games in the rulebook and on Board Game Geek, and I recommend that you look at those variants if you're interested in playing with higher player counts. 
The standard two-player game that we've shown should give you a deep foundation to understand the game completely and get started playing, even if you want to play with higher player counts. There's also a very good solo variant to this game, and we'll be highlighting that solo variant in a later full playthrough video. All right, everybody, that was our video. Thanks so much for watching. We hope that it was helpful and we hope that it was informative. If you still have questions about how to play the game, please leave a comment below or email us directly at thedicereview at gmail.com. If you want to hear more from The Dicey Review, you can check out The Dicey Review podcast. It can be found at iTunes, Stitcher, Tuned In, SoundCloud, or any other podcast app. If you want to read more from The Dicey Review, we have written articles on our website, thedicereview.com, and as always, you can connect with us at our Board Game Geek Guild. Thanks so much for watching. Until next time, we'll see you at the table.